வணக்கம் தி அல்னார் நர்வ் ஆஸ் சச் ஹேஸ் குவைட் அன் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்டபிள் அண்ட் ஈஸி அனாட்டமி பட் தெர் ஆர் சர்டன் நியூவான்சஸ் இன் தி அனாட்டமி தட் வி நீட் டு நோ பிஃபோர் வி ட்ரை டு காம்ப்ரிஹெண்ட் த கிளினிக்கல் இம்ப்ளிகேஷன்ஸ் ஆஃப் தி அனாட்டமி ஆர் பிஃபோர் வி அட்டெம்ப்ட் அ சர்ஜிக்கல் எக்ஸசைஸ் ஆன் தி அல்னார் நர்வ் we need to understand the anatomy not only from the structural point of view but also the clinical significance of these anatomical nuances like for instance the anatomical significance of the topography of the nerve and the arrangement of fascicles in the nerve the anatomical significance of the level of the injury or even the anatomical significance in the entrapment neuropathies that can be seen in the ulnar nerve in short everything about the anatomy of the ulnar nerve that the clinician and the surgeon need to know we shall deal with the ulnar nerve anatomy in a very structured manner we shall first see how the ulnar nerve is formed then we shall consider the course and the branches of the ulnar nerve at various segments of its travel around the upper limb and then we shall see the anatomical variations that can exist and finally the clinical significance of the anatomy the ulnar nerve is formed from the brachial plexus it is one of the terminal branches of the medial cord of the plexus the other terminal branch being the medial root of the median nerve so the nerve fibers reaching the ulnar nerve are mainly from the c8 and t1 roots the majority of the motor fibers arise from the c8 and t1 roots and even the majority of the sensory fibers reach the ulnar nerve from the c8 and t1 roots apart from the c8 and t1 contributions to the ulnar nerve it has been proved that there are fibers from the c7 root that travel along the posterior division of the middle trunk then along the posterior division of the lower trunk and reach the anterior division of the lower trunk which continues as the medial cord these fibers contribute up to 6% of the sensory fibers of the ulnar nerve this formation of the ulnar nerve occurs in the region of the axilla we shall now follow the ulnar nerve and see the course and branches of the nerve in the upper arm the lower arm the elbow the forearm the wrist and the hand after its formation the ulnar nerve runs medial to the brachial artery and the coracobrachialis muscle this shows the coracobrachialis muscle getting inserted to the middle of the humerus that is the brachial artery and the brachial artery lies over the medial intermuscular septum the ulnar nerve runs medial to this brachial artery and at the level of the insertion of the coracobrachialis the ulnar nerve pierces the intermuscular septum to enter the posterior compartment that is the medial cord from which we get the ulnar nerve and the other terminal branch of the medial cord being the medial root of the median nerve the ulnar nerve does not give any branch in the upper arm once the ulnar nerve enters the posterior compartment of the arm by perforating the medial intermuscular septum it runs now on the posterior surface of the intermuscular septum anterior to the medial head of the triceps muscle that is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the olecranon process of the ulna and the triceps muscle getting inserted into the olecranon process the ulnar nerve then enters behind the medial epicondyle about 8 cm proximal to the medial epicondyle is the arcade of struthers that is the facial band between the medial head of the triceps and the medial intermuscular septum under which the ulnar nerve passes in the lower arm <coughs> in the lower arm also there are no branches from the ulnar nerve now the ulnar nerve that is the posterior compartment of the arm must enter the anterior compartment of the forearm it does so by running posterior to the medial epicondyle where it lies between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon process of the ulna it is covered by the humero ulnar arcade that is a condensation of fibers between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon process of the ulna proximally it then runs in the epicondylar groove this is the ulnar head of the flexor carpi ulnaris and this is the humeral head of the flexor carpi ulnaris and in between these two there is a condensation of fascia known as the osbourne's ligament 
the ulnar nerve passes under this ligament. It gives off the branch to the flexor carpi ulnaris and it also gives off a sensory branch to the elbow joint at this level. This segment of the path of the ulnar nerve under the Osborne's ligament is known as a cubital tunnel. The nerve exits the cubital tunnel by passing between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris and enters the anterior compartment of the forearm. The first branch of the ulnar nerve is given off at this area which is a sensory branch to the elbow joint. It may give off a motor branch to the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle also. After exiting the cubital tunnel, the ulnar nerve lies on the anterior surface of the flexor distorum profundus. That is the radius bone and the origin of the flexor distorum profundus that is seen extending along from the radius to the ulna. The ulnar nerve exiting from between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris comes to lie on the surface of the flexor distorum profundus. It gives a branch to the medial side that is the little and ring finger portions of the flexor distorum profundus and also supplies the flexor carpi ulnaris. It then gives off the dorsal sensory branch which then passes deep to the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon to the dorsal side to innervate the skin on the dorsum of the ulnar side of the hand and the dorsum of the ring and little fingers over the proximal phalangeal regions. The palmar cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve is also given off about 5 cm above the wrist which supplies the area over the hypothenar eminence. At the level of the middle of the forearm, the ulnar nerve becomes superficial and meets with the ulnar artery, which lies on its radial side. So the motor branches given away by the ulnar nerve in the forearm are the branches to the flexor carpi ulnaris and the branches to the medial half of the flexor digital profundus, that is the ring and little fingers, which is given off about 5 cm distal to the medial epicondyle and the sensory branches that and the sensory branches that are given off are the palmar cutaneous branch arising 5 cm above the wrist supplying the skin over the hypothenar area and the dorsal cutaneous branch which is given off before the flexor carpi ulnaris becomes tendinous and this nerve supplies the skin over the dorsum of the ulnar side of the hand and the dorsum of the proximal phalangeal regions of the ring and little fingers. As the ulnar nerve reaches the wrist, it becomes superficial to the flexor retinaculum and lies under the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris before the tendon gets attached to the pisiform bone. The nerve then turns radial to the pisiform to lie in the Guyans canal. Within the canal, the ulnar nerve divides into the terminal branches, that is the superficial sensory branch and the deep motor branch. The deep branch passes between the abductor digiti minimi and the flexor digiti minimi brevis. It then perforates the opponent's digiti minimi and follows the course of the deep palmar arch beneath the flexor tendons lying superficial to the intrachiae muscles. We shall now see the branching pattern of the superficial sensory branch. This is the deep branch of the ulnar nerve and this superficial branch. The superficial branch first gives off a motor branch to the palmaris brevis and then divides into two terminal branches which supply the ulnar side of the little finger and the contiguous sides of the ring and little fingers. It also supplies articular branches to the wrist joint. As far as the motor branches of the ulnar nerve are concerned, there is a very easy way of remembering the branches 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 1 that is 4 dorsal intrachiae muscles, 3 palmar intrachiae muscles, 3 hypothenar muscles, 2 lumbricals that is the third and fourth lumbricals, 2 heads of the adductor pollicis muscle and lastly 1 deep head of the flexor pollicis brevis. The blood supply of the ulnar nerve is derived from three major sources. The superior ulnar collateral artery known as the SUCA, the inferior ulnar collateral artery and 
the posterior ulnar recurrent artery. To summarize the branches of the ulnar nerve, we have motor branches in the forearm level supply, supplying the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digital propundus of the ring and little fingers and motor branches in the hand supplying the palmaris brevis, four dorsal intraarchiae, three palmar intraarchiae, three hypothenar muscles, two lumbricals, two heads of the adductor pollicis and one head of the flexor pollicis brevis. And as far as the sensory branches are concerned, three sensory branches to the skin, the palmar cutaneous branch, the dorsal cutaneous branch and the superficial sensory branch to the ulnar side of the little finger and the adjacent sides of the ring and little fingers and articular branches to the elbow joint and the wrist joint. Having seen the common anatomy that occurs, we shall now see the anatomical variations that can occur. There are two connections that can occur between the median nerve and the ulnar nerve in the forearm. The first being the Martin Gruber anastomosis where axons leaving either main trunk of the median nerve or the anti interosseous nerve crossing through the forearm to join the main trunk of the ulnar nerve and ultimately innervating the intrinsic hand muscles. And the Marinacci communication, which is the reverse of the Martin Gruber communication, where there is a ulnar to median communication. Here, in trauma to the median nerve at the forearm, preservation of the median nerve innervated hand muscles occurs despite denervation of the forearm flexors. Similarly, in the hand, two types of abnormal communications can occur between the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. The Ricci canoe anastomosis, which is a connection between the deep branch of the ulnar nerve and the recurrent branch of the median nerve at the thenar eminence, and the Berettini anastomosis, which is a communication between the common digital nerves that arise from the ulnar and median nerves in the palmar surface of the hand. Now we shall see the clinical significance of the anatomy that we have learned so far. This can be divided into the anatomical considerations in topography, anatomical considerations in injury to the ulnar nerve and lastly anatomical considerations in entrapment of the nerve. Topography deals with the arrangement of individual fascicles that is motor and sensory within the ulnar nerve just above the level of the elbow the mixed sensory and motor fibers destined for the hand are more lateral and volar, while medially are the fibers destined for the forearm. Below the elbow, the mixed fibers destined for the hand become more superficial on the nerve, while medially the fibers destined for the dorsal cutaneous nerve are seen. At the level of the middle of the forearm, the motor fibers to the hand muscles are superficial and the cutaneous sensory nerve fibers are deeper and usually arranged in the form of two fascicles. After the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve is given off, the motor fibers move more medially in the main trunk of the ulnar nerve and the sensory fibers are located more laterally. And at the level of the Guyans canal, the separation of the superficial sensory fibers and the deep motor fibers occurs. When there is an injury to the ulnar nerve, the clinical findings according to the level of the injury are dictated by the anatomical factors. When there is an injury to the ulnar nerve, distal to the innervation of the forearm muscles, it is known as low ulnar nerve palsy and this can occur in injuries at the distal third of the forearm wrist or the palm. Here, the intrinsic muscles are paralyzed and there is a sensory loss on the hand. The forearm muscles are typically spared and injury to the ulnar nerve proximal to the innervation of the forearm muscles is known as high ulnar nerve palsy, usually involves injuries around the elbow. Here, the intrinsic muscles are paralyzed and there is a sensory loss both on the dorsum of the hand and the ring and little fingers and typically the forearm muscles are paralyzed also. Now we shall see the anatomical considerations in entrapment neuropathies. Entrapment neuropathy of the ulnar nerve typically occurs in two areas. The first is compression around the elbow and the second is compression at the Guyans canal or the ulnar tunnel. We shall first consider the ulnar nerve entrapment that occurs around the elbow. This can occur at five important sites. The first site is proximal to the elbow where the ulnar nerve can be compressed either by the arcade of struthers 
or anteriorly by the medial intermuscular septum or posteriorly by the hypertrophied medial head of the triceps muscle. The second site of compression of the ulnar nerve around the region of the elbow is the area of the medial epicondyle. Here, the ulnar nerve can get compressed when there is a valgus deformity of the bone. As the nerve lies within the epicondylar groove, it can also get compressed by either lesions within the joint or outside the groove. Dislocation or subluxation of the nerve can also occur at this level causing an injury to the nerve. The next important site of compression of the ulnar nerve at the region of the elbow is the cubital tunnel about which we shall be seeing soon. And lastly, as the nerve exits from the flexor carpi ulnaris and enters the forearm, the flexor pronator aponeurosis may sometimes cause a compression of the nerve. We shall now see in detail about the arcade of struthers and the cubital tunnel. The arcade of struthers was first described in 1973 by Kane. It refers to thickening of the brachial fascia from the medial intermuscular septum to the medial head of the triceps brachii muscle at a variable distance above the medial humeral epicondyle. This can cause compression of the ulnar nerve. This arcade of Struthers differs from the Struthers ligament which was described by John Struthers in 1854. This consists of a fibrous band from a bone spur located on the anteromedial surface of the lower third of the humerus, otherwise known as the supracondylar process, to the medial humeral epicondyle. This can cause compression of the median nerve and the brachial artery. The cubital tunnel, on the other hand, is an anatomical space that extends from posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus through its passage between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. The roof of this tunnel is formed by the flexor carpi ulnaris fascia and the Osborne's ligament. The floor is formed by the elbow joint capsule which consists of the posterior and transverse bands of the medial collateral ligament and the side walls are formed by the medial epicondyle and the olecranon. The Osborne's ligament is a triangular connective tissue joining the proximal ulnar and humeral heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. The second important site of ulnar nerve entrapment after the region of the elbow is the Guyans canal. Described way back in 1861 by Jean Casimir Felix Guyan who later published many books on urology. This Guyans canal is a semi-rigid longitudinal canal in the wrist about 4 cm long beginning proximally at the transverse carpal ligament and ending at the aponeurotic arch of the hypothenar muscles. The roof of this canal is formed by the superficial palmar carpal ligament. The floor is formed by part of the flexor retinaculum and the origin of the hypothenar muscles. The pisiform bone and the proximal portion of the pisohamate ligament form the medial wall of the Guyans canal and the lateral wall is formed by the hook of the hamate bone. The Guyans canal contains the passage of the ulnar artery and ulnar nerve from the forearm into the hand and it is within this canal that the ulnar nerve bifurcates into the superficial sensory branch and the deep motor branches. For ease of understanding the problems that can occur due to compression of the ulnar nerve at the Guyans canal, it has been divided into three zones. The first zone consists of the portion of the Guyans canal proximal to the bifurcation of the nerve and compression in zone 1 will lead to both motor and sensory problems. Zone 2 involves mainly the deep motor branch and this happens in conditions like hook of the hamate fractures and the symptoms are mainly motor with paralysis of the intrinsic muscles. Zone 3 involves mainly the superficial sensory branch hence the symptoms are mainly sensory. Zone 3 can get involved in conditions like ulnar artery thrombosis. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more about the other nerves, the median nerve and the radial nerve. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.